How's it going everyone? This is Pirate Canvas here and this is going to be my annual video game review compilation video where I basically take all my video game reviews and make them into one big compilation video just to end out the year. And I've made a lot of videos in terms of game reviews and a lot of them I am very proud of and some I wish I could have, you know, done a little bit more justice to. But you know what? I enjoyed making these videos and I figured what better way than to showcase all that than by making one big mega package for you guys so that way you can watch everything that I've made and hopefully find some good out of it because this year, let me tell you, has been perhaps the worst year of everyone's lives. I mean, we have the pandemic, the riots, and all the celebrity deaths and everything. Just a very, very shitty year, and I'm hoping that in 2021, things will start to pick back up and we can get back to normal, hopefully. But I'm, I'm hoping to try to make more content that, you know, will suit you guys and will suit me, because I'm all about improving my videos and improving the quality and everything. That's, that's one big step that I'm going to try to take with this but nevertheless uh i hope you guys enjoy this and hopefully you have a nice new year's and yes this will be the last video that i upload for the year and i'm gonna be uploading my next review in 2021 so i'll see you guys in 2021 enjoy this compilation video Mario, Mario, Mario. Love him or hate him, he's done it all. He's been a carpenter, a plumber, a tennis player, a golfer, a boxing referee, a porn star. And you may be wondering why this exists. Because it's the fucking internet. Of course it exists. But that's not what we are here to talk about. We are here to talk about my most fondest gaming memories as a kid with Mario, which is, of course, the classic puzzle game that we all know and love, Yoshi's Cookie. I mean, Dr. Mario. Released on the NES and Game Boy in 1990, this game became a smash hit and would go on to spawn many iterations, as well as Dr. Mario being prominently featured in the Smash Brothers games. Because when he isn't busting viruses, he's kicking ass and taking names. That's why for this video I'm going to be reviewing the original Dr. Mario on the NES, which I also happen to have on my Nintendo Switch, so let's take a look at it and see how well it holds up. So when you start up the game, you're greeted with the iconic title screen, and seriously, what's there not to love about this title screen? You have the animated sprites, you have the catchy music, and that green checker pattern background. Because it's the 1990s and everybody knows that checkered pattern backgrounds are radical. Yeah, we use radical. Come on, get with the times. Anyways, on the title screen, you select which game mode you want to play, which there is one player or two player mode. Which we'll get into the two player mode, but for now, I'm gonna stick with what I know best, and that is, of course, I'm going solo. There really isn't much given in terms of story. According to the instruction manual, Mario decided to become a doctor and work in the Virus Research Center at the Mushroom Kingdom Hospital. Which as expected, things go wrong and viruses bust free, thus Dr. Mario has to use his trusty Mega Vitamins, a medicine of his own invention, wrap your head around that one, to prevent the spread of this outbreak. And yeah, I realize that sounds like a lame premise for a puzzle game, but come on people, it's a puzzle game. You're not gonna get any grand story out of this, especially in a Mario game. Come on people, when have you realized that? As for the gameplay itself, it's pretty self-explanatory. Much like in the vein of Tetris, it is a tile-style puzzle game where Dr. Mario throws pills in a bottle filled with viruses. You control the pills that Dr. Mario throws by using the D-pad and pressing A to flip them around. The objective here is to match the pill with a correctly colored virus, which there are three colors, red, blue, and yellow. 
The viruses are displayed on the magnifying glass and look at them, they are cute as hell. And that's one of the things I like about this game is the overall presentation. Like you have the cute sprites and the overall charm is just delightful to see. And you don't get that with a lot of games. Nevertheless, to get rid of a virus, you must stack four of the matching colors in a row, which can be either vertical or horizontal. And when you get rid of a virus, they go into a seizure and then they disappear. Like, damn, that's one effective drug. And how cool would that be if this drug was real? Like, we wouldn't have to go to the doctor or worry about hospital bills. Hell, this could save us a lot of money. Like, come on, scientists! Why aren't you on this? But anyways, once you've gotten rid of all the viruses, it's on to the next level, where the difficulty ramps up, as well as the total number of viruses you have to clear. And you better be mastering this game, because once you get to the higher levels, this game does not fuck around. Of course, you have the option of choosing what level you want to start on right off the bat, in the game's setup screen as well as the speed of which Dr. Mario throws the pills, which there are three options, low, medium, or high. And trust me, don't go with the high option. No! No! Oh no! Oh no! I didn't mean to put it there! No! Oh, fuck you! Fuck! No! What? <laughs> Anyways, where was I? You also get to select from two different music tracks, Fever and Chill, which have become iconic songs in the franchise. Yet, as much as I love each of these songs, there is no option to change them during gameplay, which means you are stuck with that one song until you get a game over. Speaking of which, just like in Tetris, you only get a game over once you reach the top. And let me just say, the game over music always creeped me out as a kid. Especially the way the viruses are animated and Dr. Mario's expression. It's like, oh fuck, I messed up. But it's okay, you get to try again, where you'll most likely fuck up again and again. Oh yeah, did I forget to mention this game gets really hard? Especially when you reach the higher levels, where one simple mistake can ultimately lead you to a game over. So you have to think quickly and carefully where you place your pills, and make sure you don't stack them all the way to the top. After every five levels, you get treated with a cutscene where the viruses are sitting on top of a tree as the clouds move by and- Wait, was that a giant chicken? Alright, I gotta lock the door and- Whoa! What the fuck? Is that a giant chicken? Damn, did I just hit my head this morning? Anyways, if you manage to complete level 20 in the high speed setting, then you get treated with the secret UFO ending. That's right, Dr. Mario did the UFO ending nine years before Silent Hill made it look cool, so let that sink in, bitches. Lastly, let's talk about the best feature of this game, and that is, of course, the two-player mode. The objective of two-player mode is completely different from your standard one-player game. In two-player mode, each player has their own board, and it's a race to see who clears their board first. The first person to win three times wins overall. And this is the mode where you can be an asshole to the other player. By causing chain reactions or simply clearing multiple viruses simultaneously, you can cause capsules to drop on the other player's field, thus screwing them up big time. As a kid, this mode right here costed me so many friendships and so many broken controllers, but fuck, it was so much fun. But regardless whether you play this game on one player or two players, Dr. Mario is a very addictive puzzle game. Like, no joke, I ended up recording like two hours of footage for this review, and I just couldn't stop playing it. I don't know what makes Dr. Mario such an addicting game, but overall it's certainly a game that doesn't get boring. And I guess that's the reason why I liked Dr. Mario and Tetris as a kid, because they were fun games despite being puzzle games, and they were really fun and easy to get into. 
Hell, there really isn't much that I can complain about with Dr. Mario. The controls are simple, it still runs without any issues, the graphics and overall presentation is delightful to the eyes, and the music is catchy and has become some of the most iconic music in gaming. So I don't see any reason why you shouldn't pick up this game unless you're just not into puzzle games. But if you're looking for an addictive puzzle game and you're a Mario fan, then pun intended, Dr. Mario is your favorite. Now, you can find copies of Dr. Mario on the NES for like $5 on eBay, but if you can't find a copy, you can easily play the game on your Nintendo Switch if you have a Nintendo Online subscription. And if you don't have the Nintendo Switch or Nintendo Online subscription, then you can play the game on your NES Classic if you have one of those. And honestly, it doesn't really matter how you play this game, just play it because Dr. Mario is one of the best puzzle games you'll ever play. And that's going to be it for my review of Dr. Mario. And stay tuned for next time because we're going to be taking a look at Resident Evil. Fuck! If you were a wrestling fan growing up in the late 80s to early 90s, then chances are you watched the WWF, or better known today as the WWE, which is still the biggest wrestling promotion in the world. It's the company that gave us the likes of Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, Macho Man, Bret Hart, and many, many more. And yeah, yeah, pro wrestling isn't real, but as a fan, you were invested in the matches, you were invested in the stories and the characters, so none of that shit really mattered. Wrestling has created some of the most fondest moments for me as a kid. In fact, me and my cousins would go out on the trampoline and reenact some of those moments, which we would end up hurting each other. But still, good times. That is until we got introduced to the world of wrestling video games, which gave us the power to recreate our favorite matches, make fantasy matches, and hell, we could put ourselves into the game. I mean, what more could you ask for as a kid? Besides begging your parents to go to an autograph signing, but still, what more could a kid ask for? But nevertheless, as much as I want to talk about my favorite wrestling games of all time, Today, we're not going to be doing that. Instead, we're going to be playing the NES WWF games. Because let me tell you something, brother. These games are notoriously bad, and the only person that can do the job is Pirate Canvas. So what you going to do when Pirate Mania plays shitty wrestling games with you? The first game we're going to take a look at is WWF WrestleMania, which was the first licensed NES game released in 1987, published by Acclaim and developed by Rare? That's right, the same Rare that gave us GoldenEye 007, Banjo-Kazooie, Banjo-Tooie, Perfect Dark, and Donkey Kong 64 made WWF WrestleMania on the NES. Let that sink in. You gotta be joking me! When you start up the game, you get greeted with perhaps the most horrifying image of Hulk Hogan ever ill-conceived. Seriously, why didn't you ask Tony Atlas to draw you a good picture of Hulk Hogan? But <laughs> Don't have a clue. Oh, but you gotta love the slogan to this game. Bigger, better, badder. Hmm, I wonder. Anyways, in this game you have the option of singles match or tournament mode where you go through the whole roster, which I gotta say the game at least has a good roster of wrestlers to choose from. You have Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, Macho Man Randy Savage, the Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase, Bam Bam Bigelow, and the Honky Tonk Man. Cause you gotta have the honkster in the game, you gotta have the Honky Tonk Man, cause everybody loves the Honky Tonk Man, even Kane. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
As for the gameplay itself, it's nothing too special. You stumble around the ring until you eventually hit the guy, which this game doesn't require any skill at all. Each wrestler has an energy meter which you fill up by collecting icons that get tossed in the ring. And each wrestler has their own specific icon that they can collect. Like Andre the Giant collects big slabs of ham, the Honky Tonk Man collects guitars, and Hulk Hogan collects wooden crosses? Where do you think I get these 24 inch pythons, brother? It's not from the vitamins, it's from the prayers, brother. Yet by far the worst aspect in this game is the controls. Like seriously, I couldn't figure out how to pull off any signature or finishing move, which I don't think you even can. I know you can do a body slam, punches and kicks, a cartwheel, and a flying elbow from the turnbuckle, which is supposed to be the Macho Man's finisher, but good luck connecting with it. You can also hold the B button to run through the ropes, but good luck connecting with any moves as you'll just knock yourself on your ass over and over. But the worst thing about the controls is pinning your opponent. Like seriously, I have the guy's energy all the way down, he's laying there flashing on the ground, and yet I can't seem to pin him. I'm pushing every single fucking button that I possibly can, which there's only two buttons! For some reason you have to push some sort of combination of buttons in order to pin. I mean this isn't fucking Mortal Kombat, nor is it fucking rocket science. Just have one button for the pin. But nevertheless, there really isn't much good I can say about this game. The music for each wrestler sounds alright for the most part, and the wrestlers look like their real life counterparts, but everything else about this game just sucks. The controls suck, and with the lack of signature and finishing moves, there just wasn't much thought put into this game. And that's all I have to say about WWF WrestleMania, but we got three more games to go through. Oh boy. Moving on to the next game, WrestleMania Challenge. This game was released in 1990, also developed by Rare, yet this time published by LJN, which they would go on to publish the other games after this one. WrestleMania Challenge is actually a slight improvement over the last game, which isn't really saying much. But let's talk about the good aspects of this game. One of the things that I really like about this game is the fact that you have more options when it comes to match types. Of course you still have the single match mode, you also have a tag team, a handicap, a 3 on 3 survivor series match, and a championship mode, which is basically your standard tournament mode. You also have a much bigger roster, as this time you have Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, Macho King Randy Savage, The Ultimate Warrior, The Big Boss Man, Brutus the Barber Beefcake, Ravishing Rick Rude, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, and yourself, which is the wrestler that you play as in championship mode. That's right, Ultimate Warrior. I'm coming for that WWF World Heavyweight Championship, otherwise my name isn't yourself! The game itself is in isometric style, where you can move around any direction you want. Hell, you can even go outside the ring, and also there's a crowd, unlike the other game, which actually adds to the overall feel of watching a wrestling match on your TV. Not only that, the energy bar makes a return, however, it works differently from the other game. Instead of collecting icons, all you have to do is stand there and do nothing, and it gradually builds up by itself. Yeah, I'm not kidding. But I gotta hand it to the developers that the controls are a whole lot better in this game. You also pin by just pressing the B button, so no more weird button combinations. Also there is a lot more moves to your arsenal than in the previous game. However, moving around is a bit sluggish, and while I'm glad there's more moves, the problem mostly lies with how each wrestler plays, and that most of them have the same moves. So there really isn't much difference of who you play as. Yet one of the biggest problems I have with this game is the fact that I can't seem to get back in the ring, and I end up losing via countout. And don't bother doing any turnbuckle moves because otherwise you'll just land outside the ring. Which, once again, I must iterate, I cannot get back inside the ring. But needless to say, WWF WrestleMania Challenge is a slight improvement over WWF WrestleMania. Which isn't saying much, but let me just say that this game is miles ahead of the next game we're going to be talking about, which is WWF WrestleMania Steel Cage Challenge. Oh shit. WWF WrestleMania Steel Cage Challenge was released in 1992, published by LJN, and was not developed by Rare, 
but by another developer, Sculptured Software, who are best known for developing the SNES port for Doom, the Super Star Wars series, as well as most of the SNES ports of Mortal Kombat, which I guess is interesting to know? It's just too bad that Steel Cage Challenge is one of the worst wrestling games I've ever played. Like seriously, this is a huge step down from the previous game. In this game, we get 10 wrestlers to choose from. You have Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, Ted DiBiase, IRS, Bret Hart, The Undertaker, Jake Roberts, Sid Justice, Rowdy Piper, and the Mountie. Because you gotta have the Mountie, eh? Everybody loves the Mountie, eh? Even Sid Justice. Yeah, there's no beating around the bush. This game sucks. The controls just suck, as I can't even seem to pull off any other move besides a power slam, as well as your standard punches and kicks. You can also climb the turnbuckle and run the ropes, but good luck connecting any moves from it, because you'll always fail. Also, the wrestlers move a lot slower than they did in the previous games, which I get that they were kind of going for a more realistic movement, but this just comes off as tedious as fuck. The main feature of this game is of course the steel cage match, which all you have to do is drain your opponent's energy, then just start climbing the cage with the directional pad. What sucks about this is that if your opponent gets up, then you are forced to stop climbing the cage, which is stupid, yet that's not even the dumbest aspect about this. Now in a normal cage match, you're supposed to climb over the cage. Not in this game, all you have to do is climb the top of the cage and you win. Seriously, did the developers watch a cage match before making this shitty game? Now the music is the only thing that this game gets right, but listen to the crowd. Like, it sounds like the fucking ocean. So yeah, WWF WrestleMania Steel Cage Challenge is the worst game out of the bunch. It has awful controls, awful sound and graphics, and the lack of moves again. Why can't they get the finishers in these games? I'm sick of seeing the same repetitive moves and the monotonous gameplay. And we are just down to one more game, guys, so please, for the love of fuck, give me something good. I mean, at least let it be a golden turd. I'll accept that. Just give me something. The last game on our list is WWF King of the Ring, released in 1993 and was developed by Grey Matter Inc which this was their last game that they ever made. It wouldn't surprise me if Vince McMahon made the call himself. You better have the game finished by next week, or else you're fired! But sir, we, we haven't put all the signature moves in it, nor do we have any finisher moves. Hell, we don't even have a submission system! Well, I don't give a damn. I want the game to be out as soon as possible, because it's going to be some good shit! Nevertheless, the game has 11 wrestlers to choose from. Of course, you have Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, Bret Hart, The Undertaker, Shawn Michaels, Razor Ramon, Bam Bam Bigelow, Yokozuna, Mr. Perfect, The Narcissist, Lex Luger, and you! Which is a wrestler you get to name and customize your own stats. And yeah, the game includes a stat system, which each wrestler has their own stat. As there are some wrestlers who are more agile and quicker, or there are wrestlers who could take abuse in the ring. However, the problem is that it doesn't really matter who you choose, because here we are again stumbling with the same problem as the other games. The lack of variety in moves, because each wrestler has the same move set in this game. Oh, but they included a suplex in this game! Despite the fact that it took them four games to get us a suplex, but there it is! As for the overall gameplay itself, it's kinda fun. The controls are simple, you can easily get in and outside the ring, you can climb the turnbuckle, and you can actually control where you land! Oh my gosh, a novel concept! But nevertheless, WWF King of the Ring is the best WWF game on the system. But that's not really saying much, as the game has problems. It doesn't have great graphics, it doesn't have great sound, and not only that, the lack of moves, which seems to be a problem with most of these WWF games. As licensed games, they utterly fail at representing their licenses properly. Even though one of them might be worth playing, I still would not recommend you to play any of these WWF games 
unless you want to. Which if you do decide to play these games, play at your own risk. And that's gonna be it for this video. If you guys haven't already, be sure to subscribe to this channel for more reviews like this one. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go watch some more of those empty arena shows because they're a lot worth it than playing these shitty games. See ya. What you gonna do when Pirate Mania runs wild on you? Predator on the NES. The 1987 Predator is one of my all-time favorite movies starring one of my all-time favorite actors, Arnold fucking Schwarzenegger. Yep, that's his middle name, and don't you forget it. Super serious face. The thing I love the most about this movie is the fact that it combines die-hard action and sci-fi horror, which it was different from the horror movies that I was accustomed to. You know, the ones that focus on the scares and the excessive gore, which was always nice. However, while Predator is definitely gore-heavy, it manages to pull off the scares in a different way. One of my biggest fears, even to this day, is being watched. I don't like it when someone's behind me, or don't like it when someone's watching me eat, nor do I like it when people watch me sleep. I think that's creepy as fuck, by the way. And that's essentially what the Predator does in this movie. He is like a hunter stalking his prey, which is the underlying theme to this movie. He has thermal vision, which allows him to see his victim, and it can detect a person's body temperature which I thought was one of the coolest looking effects I've ever seen in a movie. Yet the horrifying part is when the Predator actually removes his mask, and Arnold tells him that he's one ugly motherfucker. But yeah, I love this movie so much, and one day I may sit down and actually review this movie in depth, but for now, let's talk about the NES game. First thing you need to know about this game is the fact that it was actually developed by Packin Video, the company that also made other movie licensed games on the NES such as Die Hard and Rambo. However, they are best known for a little farming simulation game I'm pretty sure no one has ever heard of before called Harvest Moon. That's right, they made the first Harvest Moon game for the Super Nintendo, and the rest was history. But let's get back to Predator. So the other thing you need to know about this game is the fact that it's actually a port of the MSX version, which shares a lot of similarities with the NES version. It reuses some of the graphics, as well as the music. This is what the MSX version sounds like. This is what the NES version sounds like. Yep, it's the same music by the same composer. Just a fun little factoid I figured I'd throw in there because I'm such a nerd like that. But nevertheless, when you start up the game you get treated with a nice little cinematic of the Predator's ship shooting out what appears to be a pod to Earth, in which the Predator is sent to Earth to cause havoc and hunt down some humans. Why that ugly motherfucker 
Much like the movie that this game is based on, you take on the role of Major Alan Dutch Schaefer, a Vietnam War veteran whose team is sent out on a rescue mission in a vast jungle in Central America. But of course, everything goes wrong as each and every one of Dutch's team members gets killed off, leaving Dutch as the sole survivor who must now contempt with this unknown alien assassin. So the game does a pretty good job of following some of the plot points from the movie, despite some things being changed like, wait, why is Dutch wearing pink? I don't know about you guys, but I watched the movie and I guess I must have been colorblind or something because I don't remember seeing Dutch wear pink in the movie. Did you? Like seriously, I get that the NES had a limited color palette, but why would you go with pink in a hostile jungle setting? It'd be the same as wearing a signpost on you that says shoot me. Anyways, you start the game without any weapons, even though it looks like Dutch is holding a gun. Either that or he's holding a pretend gun. But seriously, why wouldn't he have his weapons already on him? He's a mercenary! Hell, if I was being sent out to a jungle and I had to fight a predator, I'd be fucking decked out head to toe. I'd be looking like a fucking space marine. So the game is your typical action side-scroller, where you must reach the end while dealing with enemies. Nothing more, nothing less. However, instead of starting out with a gun like you would expect, you start out with your fists, which doesn't really do you any good because not only do you have any range, but you also can't duck and punch, which is a problem as most of the enemies in this game are on the ground. Also, gotta love the enemy selection here. You have the green scorpions, which will allow you to ride on them, and the red scorpions who won't let you ride on them because they're assholes. You also have soldiers, some slimes ripped straight from Dragon Quest, butterflies, birds that crap all over you, and a bunch of other random shit that I think someone had too much time on their hands with. Yeah, there is a lot of enemies in this game, and none of them make any sense and become more of a hindrance, if anything. Which I get it. You didn't want to make a game where it's just you fighting the predator. I get that. But you could have put a little bit more thought into this. Like, seriously, you couldn't have thought of any other enemies to put in this game, like tigers, snakes, spiders. You know, things that you might find in a jungle. But no, let's just put some random shit in there. I mean, the kids will eat it up, right? Nevertheless, there are weapons in this game. In fact, you can pick up the machine gun at the very start of the first level, which it's easy to miss because it's up in a fucking tree. You also have the grenades which come in handy for blowing up rocks that block your path. However, the grenades aren't very helpful against enemies, mainly because you'll never be quick enough to throw them. Also, it's a bitch just getting them to stick to the rocks. And yes, if you are not careful, the grenades will explode on you and SON OF A FUCKING BITCH! Then you have the laser gun, which not only destroys rocks, but is the only weapon that can be used against the predator- OH FUCK! I should also mention this game is fucking hard. But we'll get into that. At the end of five levels or so, you'll be dealing with a boss, which is the predator. Or I should say, predators, because there's more than one. But let me tell you about these boss fights. Oh boy, they are a fucking joke. All you have to do is just keep firing your laser gun at them and they'll inevitably go down. Hell, they won't even attack you as long as you keep firing at them. That's how fucking easy these boss fights are. Seriously, what's the point of even having the predator in the game at all? You might as well just be a regular enemy. Once you've completed a couple of stages, the gameplay switches over to an auto scroll shooter, which they call BIG MODE. How clever. The game devs are trying to insult our intelligence, despite the fact that the joke's on you, motherfuckers! Well, at least Dutch is wearing the appropriate colored outfit, yet why is his sprite so damn big? It's like he ate one of those giant mushrooms from Mario Maker 2. Anyways, in this mode, the screen scrolls as you shoot at bubbles and collect power-ups to your gun. What makes this mode so frustrating is not only will you get hit because you're such a big-ass target, but shooting at these bubbles is a bitch in of itself. Seriously, why is it so hard to hit these damn things? And what idiot decided to make bubbles an enemy in the first place? I mean, bubbles are the least threatening thing in the world. Ah, bubbles! And what's worse is trying to collect the power-ups, which they always seem to pull away towards the left despite the screen is auto-scrolling to the right. Yeah, whoever programmed this part deserves a swift punch in the dick. 
Once you reach the end of the stage, you'll fight a predator boss, which honestly feels like an actual boss fight. But it's after you've beaten him, you get taken back to the regular side scroller. So yeah, fuck this game. It doesn't want me to have fun when I want to. But nevertheless, you'll be switching back and forth to these game modes, and that's pretty much the point of this game. And all jokes aside, I can't really say this is an awful game, but it's not a great game either, as the difficulty of this game is fucking insane. And I'll be honest with you guys, I have no problem with a challenge in a video game, but this game is just relentless. Not only do you have to contempt with the bad enemy placement, but you also have to contempt with the awful controls as the movement and jumping is just off, which seems to be the biggest issue with this game. What doesn't help is the fact that you don't get to keep your weapons every time you finish the stage. And I ask, what's the point of even having weapons at all if I can't keep them? Another thing that makes this game so difficult is that every time you get hit, you get knocked back, which is common for games such as Castlevania and Ninja Gaiden, but in Predator, there is a lot of stages that require you to do precise platforming, and if an enemy hits you while you are jumping, you just plummet down to your death. And trust me when I say, you are going to die a lot in this game. And you only start out with three lives. Once those three lives are gone, it's game over, and you are taken right back to the title screen. Yeah, another thing to keep in mind is that the game does have unlimited continues, which that's a good thing for games like this. However, if you decide to continue, make sure you hit the continue option. Otherwise, if you choose the start option on the title screen, then that's going to erase your entire progress and you have to start the game all over again. Another thing I should mention is when you pause the game. If you push any other button on your controller besides start button, then guess what happens? You instantly die. Now this does come in handy if you find yourself stuck between rocks or you take the wrong path and end up blocked. And let me just say, while it is beneficial to have this option, it's easy to make a simple mistake. And in a game where you only have three lives, it's really not worth it in the end. And I have a confession to make. I did use save states for this game. Why? Because everything about this game is bullshit. As I mentioned, the game requires you to do precise platform jumping, which is easier said than done, as I found it difficult to even make these jumps without falling through the platform, which you will do a lot in this game. What's also frustrating about this game is some of the level layouts. Like there will be times where you won't know what you will be able to jump on, as some of the platforms aren't even platforms that you can safely land on. To make matters worse, there are some platforms that you can actually slide through. I'm not kidding. Look at how many times I've died here on stage three, all because I slid through the platform. All because this game wants to be picky on what is a platform and what isn't. Whoever programmed this game is clearly not human. I think it was the fucking Predator himself that programmed this game. Of course, I should mention the game does have health replenishers and one-ups, but you're gonna lose them quicker than you pick them up. It's kind of like trying to save your receipts, only you'll end up losing them in the end, so it's kind of pointless. Which I know that analogy doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but neither does this game, so forget about that shit, let's talk about the final boss so I can end this review. So after 30 mind grueling stages, you'll come to the epic showdown with a giant floating predator head. Really? A giant predator head? I don't see a problem with that. <laughs> All jokes aside, this is perhaps the toughest boss fight yet, as the head has two phases. The one where he's wearing a mask, and the other where the mask is off, and shit gets real. And when I say shit gets real, it gets real. Oh yeah, I died at this boss so many times, but once I figured out his pattern, I was able to achieve ultimate victory. Yes! Yes! I beat Predator! Now give me my ending that I deserve! Congratulations, you survived. You know what? This game isn't really that bad. Yeah, the game is hard with the way it controls the level design and bullshit enemy placement, 
but I actually kind of like this game, despite its flaws. I mean, it's certainly nothing like any of the other great NES action games like Contra, but I would say it's an average game that is kind of fun to play, and the music is really good. So all in all, Predator is not the worst action game on the NES. But I would definitely not say it's a great game by any stretch of the imagination. But if you want to check the game out for yourself, then by all means, go right ahead. But let me just tell you, once you beat in that game, it's going to make you into a sexual tyrannosaurus, just like me. Anyways, that's going to be it for this review. And stay tuned because next week... The hell? Why is zombie fan calling me? Hey, what's up? Hey, PC, remember you had me watch Doom Annihilation with you? Well, guess what, motherfucker? I just get to you your next review. Yeah? It's payback time, bitch. <laughs> Wonder what he sent me. No! Shit, I can't seem to get this cartridge to fit in my handheld device. How else am I going to be playing my favorite puzzle game? <gasps> Is that Dr. Mario on the Game Boy? Well, what do you know? It's a Game Boy version of Dr. Mario, which came out the exact same day as the NES version. But is it any good? Hmm... Yeah! Yeah, I'm not joking when I say that Dr. Mario on the Game Boy holds up really well to its NES counterpart. Sure, the graphics aren't as good as the NES version and there isn't any color except green. Yet, it still manages to keep the fun, addictive, pill-popping puzzle game intact. If you've never played Dr. Mario before, the goal of the game is to clear your board of the heinous viruses, which, for some reason, Dr. Mario keeps them all contained in pill bottles. Seriously, could you imagine holding a bottle full of viruses? And if it were to get into the wrong hands, we'd be screwed! Like, seriously, where's the CDC in all this? But nevertheless, the Game Boy version pretty much plays the same way as the NES version. You have to stack three pills on top of a virus, vertically or horizontally, in order to destroy the virus. Once all the viruses are destroyed, you get no music and move on to the next stage. Wait, no music? Seriously? They took out the level clearing music? Well, maybe they didn't like it. What am I saying? This is awful! Why? Come to think of it, there's no title music either. You know, the iconic Dr. Mario theme. Do do do. Do 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 do. You know, that one? It boggles my mind that the Game Boy version doesn't have that many tracks. I mean, it still has the fever and chill themes, the menu theme, and the ending theme, but that's it? Just those four tracks? Like, doesn't that seem like a ripoff to you? But nevertheless, the music sounds just as good as the NES version, so I really can't complain about the quality of the music, but still, you could have at least give me the victory theme. <laughs> But anyways, once you clear all the viruses, you move on to the next level. Rinse, lather, repeat. Now in the NES version, you had to match the pills with the virus's color, which you add red, yellow, and blue. But the original Game Boy has no color whatsoever, yet Nintendo managed to work around that by including textures on one of the viruses. So in this version, you have Dark Virus, Light Virus, and Pixely Virus. He's my favorite, by the way. You know, this amazes me. Even though this is 
isn't the NES version. The Game Boy version of Dr. Mario still manages to be just as fun and as addictive as the NES version. And in retrospect, I honestly can't say that about any other game that gets ported onto the Game Boy from the NES. Because most of them I've played are watered down versions of what I expect them to be. That isn't the case with Dr. Mario because it manages to keep all the features that made it great in the first place. You still got two player mode which can be accessible with a Game Boy Link cable. You still have rememberable music despite the fact that they took out some tracks but it still sounds just as great. And the game still manages to keep its charm despite the graphical limitations and lack of color. And yes, I still prefer the NES version over the Game Boy version but I don't see any reason to not play the Game Boy version because it's still Dr. Mario and it still has that addictive virus busting gameplay I've come to love. If you have a Game Boy and you need a great puzzle game to add to your collection, then you owe it to yourself to pick up a copy of Dr. Mario, which will cost you around 5 to 6 bucks. It's also available on the 3DS eShop for purchase if you're curious, but regardless I say pick it up and go, because you can't go wrong with a little bit of the doctor in your life. And that's where I'm gonna end it. Until next time- OH GOD! Let's be honest, Metroidvania games aren't going away anytime soon. Not to say that's a bad thing as I don't mind these types of games being made as it harkens back to one of my favorite games, Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Yet there is only so much you can do with that kind of formula until the novelty starts to wear off. Yet there is always an exception to this, and that exception is of course, Dead Cells. Developed by Motion Twin, Dead Cells takes the Metroidvania style gameplay and turns it into a roguelike game, a la Rogue Legacy, Hollow Knight, and Binding with Isaac just to bring up a few names. Combine that with some Dark Soul-esque elements such as overpowered bosses and a plethora of tough enemies you'll encounter and what you get is a brutally difficult game that may turn some people away. But if you are willing to overlook the difficulty curve, then chances are you will find Dead Cells to be fun and an enjoyable experience to be had. But nevertheless, this is Pirate Canvas and this is my in-depth review of Dead Cells. In terms of narrative, you aren't really given much, as it's all vague and left to your own interpretation. All you need to know is that you are a slime that possesses the body of a headless corpse and you must traverse through each level fighting off hordes of monsters while also picking up various weapons, upgrades, and blueprints that you'll need in order to get through the game. And trust me when I say, nothing is more rewarding than beating a tough game like Dead Cells. Much like Symphony of the Night, Dead Cells has lots of weapons at your disposal each with their own stat and special perk. This gives you, the player, a large range to explore and find out which ones work best for you. For me, I usually go with the Frost Blast and Broadsword, as the Frost Blast freezes enemies in place, thus allowing me to hack them down with my Broadsword. Because this motherfucker does a lot of damage! That's a lot of damage! Yet be warned, you can only carry two weapons at a time. Same goes for side items as well. Also another thing to keep in mind is the color, which not only determines the type of weapon you have, but also your stats. Melee weapons are indicated as red, which stands for brutality. Range weapons are purple, which stands for tactic. And the shield and parry weapons are green, which stands for survivalist. You will also find upgrades which will enhance one of these three various stats as indicated at the bottom right. You will also find certain weapons that may have two of these stats in which you can enhance one over the other or keep them both balanced. Each upgrade you get not only increases your health but the damage you dish out with each weapon and item depending on the color. 
But yes, in terms of gameplay, it's your typical hack and slash Metroidvania game with some RPG elements and a roguelike twist. The reason I say it is a roguelike is because every time you die, not only do you lose everything, but you also have to start all over again at the very beginning. Which is why I cannot stress this enough. This game is brutally difficult. Yet the game does have a progression system in the form of cells, which you gather from enemies. Cells are essentially currency in this game, in which you can purchase upgrades, weapons, and mutations. Some of the upgrades are permanent, which means you won't lose them after you die. You also find weapon blueprints throughout each level, and you can bring those to the collector, who can make these weapons available once you've given him enough cells. And once you unlock that weapon, it can be used throughout the rest of the game. As for the mutations, the mutations are basically special stat buffers that will give you certain perks depending on the weapon you use. And much like the weapons, you will have to find the blueprints to unlock each of the mutations. Also, you have the weapon forger who can upgrade your weapons and give them extra perks depending on the price. Which of course, cells aren't the only currency in this game. You also earn gold, which you can use to buy weapons, side weapons, and food in the various shops you discover. And that's essentially the progression system in a nutshell. As you unlock everything, the more weapons and special perks will become available to you. And this makes the game a lot more fun and enjoyable to play. Yet regardless how much you progress in the game, won't change the fact that the game is still difficult to a frustrating degree. Because as you progress, so does the game. And as you become stronger, the enemies become stronger. And this is where the game will start to catch on and will start throwing everything at you. Especially with the bosses. The bosses can be a real pain in the ass if you aren't careful. This is where the game starts to resemble more of Dark Souls. As the bosses not only have large health bars, but they also have their own particular patterns which you'll have to have quick reflexes for. The same can be said about the regular enemies as well, especially the elite enemies which they feel like you're fighting a boss. It's like going into a fight against Mike Tyson. So not only do you need to carefully plan out your arsenal, but you need to plan ahead and know what's in store for you. And Dead Cells does a fantastic job of reminding you that it doesn't fuck around. Also, here's a tip that I found to be very helpful. Use your quick dodge move as much as you can, and pay close attention to how enemies attack. If you carefully time it just right, then you'll be able to dodge them without taking any damage. Sure, it seems exploitive, but I say exploit it like your life depended on it, because this game will fuck you over and over again. Another element that follows the traditional roguelike setup is the fact that each time the game resets, the level layouts randomly generate. Thus, each new playthrough will be different from the last, meaning that you might have a better chance of finding better weapons and upgrades than you did previously. This of course keeps the gameplay fresh and it gives you plenty of wiggle room to try out different methods of play. You might want to take your time to explore a bit and find all the upgrades and weapons you want. Or you might want to quickly get through the level and rack up some cells to spend. Regardless how you decide to play the game, you'll find the experience of Dead Cells to be worthwhile, as the game rewards you for your progress rather than punishes you. Unlike certain people that rip off reviews. But of course, with every good game, you are bound to find flaws. One of those flaws being the repetitiveness in the early parts of the game. Unless you have unlocked certain rune stones, which give you special abilities, such as wall climbing, teleporting, smashing certain platforms, or magically growing vines like your jack in the fucking beanstalk. Unless you have any of these runes, you will not be able to progress to certain sections of the game. So get ready to play through the same levels again and again until you eventually find them. Another thing that I have an issue with is navigating. And no, it's not the map system. The map system actually works in this game, and it does show you where you've been, and it marks all the teleport gates, upgrades, weapons, shops, etc. All that is indicated on the map, so I have no problem with the map system in this game. With that said, rather my problem with the navigation is the layouts. 
Some of them can be very confusing, like, how was I supposed to know that I can climb up on that pipe? Yeah, the sewer sections are perhaps the worst offender of this, because everything looks the goddamn same. I swear I hate these sewer levels and wish they would just fucking die. Also another not so fun thing about this game is finding secret rooms. I mean, sometimes they can be rewarding. You'll find a special weapon or an amulet that is actually helpful, but most of the time you won't find anything. Thus, you're wasting precious time. And that's right, there is a timer at the bottom of the screen. If you manage to complete the level at a set time, then you can enter a room which will reward you with weapons and cells. Yet that's only if you can manage to navigate through the levels quickly enough. This also means that you won't be able to do much exploring for weapons and upgrades, which you will certainly need, otherwise you'll get your ass handed to you. And lastly, this game suffers with huge slowdown issues. Usually when there are large groups of enemies that you have to deal with, which I can only speak for the Xbox One version. I can't speak for all the other versions of the game, but yeah, that's really the only issue I have with this game in terms of performance. Everything else is solid to a T. Now the graphics for the game is stylized in the traditional pixel art. And I gotta say, the game looks gorgeous and methodical. It kinda reminds me of Castlevania mixed with a bit of Dark Souls, which of course makes sense considering that's what the game is inspired by. Hell, there are references to these games everywhere, so I don't see how anyone can miss this. But nevertheless, I love the overall attention to detail in the level designs and the sprites. And the game does an amazing job of bringing its world to life in such a unique way that it makes me appreciate all the work and effort that went into it that much more. Yet, my favorite thing about Dead Cells by far is the music. The music is so good that it complements the game like sweet poetry in motion. Each track carries its own tone with a nice blend of string instrumentation and ambience that meshes so perfectly. And despite the fact that I don't like the repetition of the game, I am still willing to put myself through that just to hear the music because the music is worth it. Lastly, I should also mention that this game also has a custom mode, where you can modify the game however you see fit. You can start with the weapons of your choice, you can also use the weapon modifiers to increase the power of your weapons, thus allowing you to breeze through the early stages quickly, and if you don't think the game is hard enough, you can also modify that as well. There are so many modifiers in custom mode to enhance and add more to your overall experience that it becomes addictive. Like seriously, I cannot stop playing this game at all. So yeah, all in all, I really love Dead Cells. Despite the repetitive nature of the game, everything else about the game, from the gameplay to the design, is just rock solid all round, and I highly recommend you play this game when you have the chance, because they are constantly updating it, and there is DLC for this game already out called Bad Seeds, that adds more levels, more monsters, and a extra boss to fight as if more couldn't be better. Which of course more is better, don't be silly. But yet, yeah, Dead Cells is an unprecedented experience that can only be described in vivid terms. It truly is one of the best games I've played in a long time, and I can only hope that there is more to come from this series. But nevertheless, thank you all so much for checking out my review for Dead Cells, and if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe and click that bell notification so you'll know when I upload my next review. Also be sure to follow me on Twitter at CanvasPirate to be kept up to date on my next videos. Anyways, this has been Pirate Canvas, and I hope to see you all soon. Tonight's matchup, The Undertaker versus Shawn Michaels. <laughs> Hit him! Hit him! So you all know how much I love pro wrestling. I've spent most of my entire life consuming and being invested in it. So I don't see no point in stopping now, 
despite the fact that the current WWE product is the drizzling shits. And AEW shows promise, yet they still have a very long ways to go before they can truly consider themselves competition. With that said, I figured I'd dip my head into another wrestling game since I've already made a video review on the four NES WWF games, which you should totally check that video out. Nevertheless, in this video I want to talk about a certain wrestling game that I hold near and dear to my heart, as it was the very first wrestling game I ever played. And that is, of course, WWF WrestleMania the arcade game on the Super Nintendo. Listen, Joe, I walked through arcades today and I see absolutely nothing to turn young players on. Nothing really grabs you. A game is a game is a game is a game. Originally released in the arcades in 1995, WWF WrestleMania the arcade game was developed by Midway, who are best known for the innovator of violent fighting games Mortal Kombat. And just like Mortal Kombat, this game is of course an arcade style fighting game which also uses digitized graphics by having the actual wrestlers portray themselves in the game. You had Bret the Hitman Hart, Shawn Michaels, Razor Ramon, Lex Luger, Doink the Clown, Yokozuna, Bam Bam Bigelow, and the Phenom himself, The Undertaker. Yet unlike Mortal Kombat, the game isn't quite heavy on the gore side. Instead, you see the wrestlers performing outlandish attacks. Instead of blood, the wrestlers would bleed valentine hearts, cartoonish style bones, dumbbells, and anything else that isn't human blood. Also, there weren't any fatalities, even though it would have been awesome to see The Undertaker rip out Doink the Clown's heart or spinal column. Yet, I don't think Vince McMahon would allow for such a thing to reflect his product. Ah, you know what's missing? A game that just rocks! But still, I remember as a kid seeing this game at my local skating rink in the arcade room and was amazed at the fact that there was a WWF game that was a lot like Mortal Kombat. Yet, I never actually got the chance to play the original arcade version. Instead, I played this game on my Super Nintendo, which that was the version that I had. And yes, there is also a Sega Genesis version as well, and both versions were handled by Sculptured Software, who also handled the console ports of Mortal Kombat. And just to get this out of the way, both ports are pretty much the same game and play just as well as each other, yet the Genesis version features all 8 wrestlers, whereas the Super Nintendo version only has 6 leaving out Yokozuna and Bam Bam Bigelow. The Genesis version also allows four wrestlers in the ring at once, just like in the original arcade, whereas the Super Nintendo version only allows three wrestlers in the ring at once. However, in terms of graphics and sound, the Super Nintendo version has the Genesis beat on that. Yet regardless, you can't go wrong with either one in my opinion, so I say play both of them. Side headlocks, clotheslines, big elbows, choke holes, sleepers, you name it Joe, it'll be in there. So with all that said and done, let's get into the actual game. So as I've mentioned, the Super Nintendo version only has six wrestlers to choose from. You have Bret the Hitman Hart, Shawn Michaels, The Undertaker, Razor Ramon, Doink the Clown, and Lex Luger. There is also an options menu which allows you to change the difficulty of the game, how much health you want to have, and the option to turn the music off. Which I can't help but ask, why would you want to do that and miss the chance to listen to each of the wrestlers theme music in 16-bit glory? What is wrong with you? But nevertheless, you choose your wrestler and you get to hear their name being announced by Vince McMahon himself. That's right, this game features the voices of Vince McMahon and Jerry the King Lawler on commentary. Which just adds more to the overall experience as it makes me feel like I'm watching a wrestling match play out on television. But yeah, the music and sound is perhaps one of the highlights to this port, as each wrestler has their own theme and each theme is perfectly replicated in 16-bit form. Oh, it's true. It's damn true. We're gonna walk right into this industry and grab them right by the- Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Now this game offers two modes for single player. There's the WWF Intercontinental title or WWF World title. Regardless which mode you choose, you'll be going through the entire roster like you normally would in a fighting game. Yet unlike your typical arcade style fighting game, 
This game will have you facing multiple fighters at once. In the arcade version, you could have up to four wrestlers in the ring at the same time. Yet I guess due to hardware limitations, the SNES version only allows three wrestlers in the ring at once, while the other wrestler has to wait their turn like a child waiting in line. I should also mention with a limited roster, most of your matches will be you facing against your color swap doppelganger, which is honestly one of the most hilarious things about this game, especially when Vince McMahon announces Brett the Hitman Heart versus Brett the Hitman Heart. Which I guess you could say, Brett is wrestling with his own shadows. Oh come on, somebody has to get that reference. I started with the basics. Before you even get a project like this, you really have to know the ropes. In terms of controls, it's as easy as applying the figure 4. You have your standard punch and kick, which is your Y and B buttons, your high punch and high kick, which is your X and A buttons, and blocking, which is your L and R buttons. And much like in the vein of Mortal Kombat, each wrestler has their own set of signature moves, and they are outlandish and funny as all hell. Like you have the Undertaker who bashes people over the head with a tombstone, or you have Doink the Clown hitting people with his trusty hammer and his shock glove, giving me yet another reason to never trust clowns. The only downside I have with performing some of these signature moves is the fact that they don't do quite as much damage as they should unless you're performing combos. Yet 9 times out of 10, you're going to rely on your running attack or performing combos as those seem to do more damage than anything. I should also mention not only can you move in the ring in any direction you want, you can also climb the turnbuckle and perform high flying moves, and you can go outside of the ring if you want to continue the carnage out there. Besides the outlandish moves, each wrestler also bleeds certain objects when you hit them, which as silly as it may seem, I think it's hilarious. Especially Lex Luger bleeding dumbbells, which I guess kind of makes sense because he's a bodybuilder wrestler, but what do you think, Lex? I don't know! Come on, you guys. There it is, right there in front of you the whole time. You're dereferencing a no-pointer. Open your eyes. Now, as much as I love this game and how much fun I had with it as a kid, this is the part where I take off my rose tinted glasses and point out some of the flaws I have with this game. For the most part, the game runs excellently in 60 frames per second, yet in the SNES version there is major slowdown, and this becomes a hindrance to the game, especially when I'm trying to perform running moves. And this problem usually occurs during handicap matches. And speaking of handicap matches, this brings me to my next issue I have with this game, the lack of features. I understand this is supposed to be an arcade style fighting game, but it's also supposed to be a wrestling game. Hell, even though the NES games were bad, at least they had different match types. In this game you only have single matches and handicap matches, which seems to be what this game likes to throw at you as you mostly find yourself in one on two or one on three matches. And to imagine what the game would run like if you had four wrestlers in the ring at the same time, holy Christ. And this might be a nitpick, but I feel like the roster in this game is so weak. They could have included other popular wrestlers like Owen Hart, the British Bulldog, King Kong Bundy, fucking Mantar. Yeah, that last one was a joke, but yeah, why not have either of those three that I mentioned instead of having Doink the Clown, who wasn't that popular, and Lex Luger, who was gone from the company at that time. But that's just my opinion. Take it as you will. Just like that, but punch it up with a little more bass. So at the end of the day, WWF WrestleMania the arcade game on the Super Nintendo is still just as fun as I remembered it to be. Sure, it may seem outlandish and cartoony, yet I appreciate the fact that it tried to be different from Mortal Kombat, which around this time there was a lot of Mortal Kombat knockoffs, so regardless, the gameplay is still mindless fun. Now there was a sequel to this game called WWF In Your House, which was only released on consoles. It was released for the PlayStation, Sega Saturn, and DOS. And trust me when I say this is a really terrible game. 
and I do plan on doing a review of this later down the line, but for right now, I'm just gonna wait and sort of cool my jets for a bit. Because I think I've had enough of these wrestling games for the time being, but let me know what you thought about this review in the comment section below. And also, be sure to subscribe to this channel for more future in-depth reviews just like this one. Also, follow me on Twitter at CanvasPirate as I look forward to any suggestions you may have. But anyways, this has been Pirate Canvas, and I'm signing off. Until next time, stay classy, people. Any questions? Just one. Can we play it? Let's do it, Mr. D. Tis the season, everyone. It's me, Pirate Canvas here, giving you a sacrilegious fuckfest as today we take a look at Exodus Journey to the Promised Land, which I can promise you guys, this ain't no good game. Let's get into it. You know there ain't no promise for tomorrow. And I have to wait. Yeah, I'm not dying anytime soon, so, uh, could you hurry up now? Oh, you might have missed it. There's the title screen. I mean, no music. That's fine. Seriously, it takes like seven seconds for this game to load up. I mean, when I pop in The Legend of Zelda, this is what happens. There it is, immediately. Title screen, no exceptions, play the fucking game, Beat Ganon, you motherfucker, you. And you can obviously tell no one gave a shit because they didn't even bother to put music in the title screen. So I guess the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Okay, so you finally give us some music after the title screen. Sounds like a fucking music box, but I'm catching it. So here's the story of Exodus' journey to the Promised Land. God saw how the Israelites were enslaved and remembered his covenant with Abraham. He chose Moses to lead them to freedom! Like, does that sound like a good, benevolent god? That sounds like a fucking bad, evil mastermind! Come on! So the game gives you two options. You can press start to play the game, or you can press select for help? Fucking help, please! Yes, I need some spiritual guidance! Basically, hitting the select button takes you to a screen that explains everything about the game and how you must use the word of God to help Moses stop the murmuring of the Israelites. Seriously, what the fuck is that even supposed to mean? How exactly is Moses supposed to use the word of God? Since he's not even carrying a Bible, since those things obviously didn't exist in Moses' time. Seriously, you confuse me, game! And on top of all that, the game also tells you to pick up five Bible questions and gather enough mana to complete each level. As if all this actually makes me look forward to playing this game. Which it doesn't. But yeah, yeah, let's waste no time and get this shit over with. Level 1. I see. Yeah. This world ain't safe anymore! Yep, that's Moses, alright, and he's shooting W's, just like in the Bible. Yet, I'm still kinda baffled that the game tells you that you're shooting the words of God, yet those aren't words, it's just a fucking letter. Seriously, who would have thought that a single letter would invoke such wrath and conviction? Hey man, what's up? Also, why is Moses underground? Did he get lost, or is this him trying to contemplate his inner struggles by burying himself as deep as he can to get away from the rest of society? Which I kinda don't blame him, I'd do the same thing. Or maybe it's because this game is actually a copy of Crystal Mines for the NES. Only it's with Bible stuff in it. It's like seriously, what else do you expect from a game based on Moses? But yeah, the goal of the game is to shoot W's at everything, pick up power-ups, Bible questions, and mana, and then find the exit, which will take you to the next level, where you do the same thing again and again. 
I mean, it's not the worst thing I've ever played from Wisdom Tree, but this one just becomes boring and tedious really quickly. I mean, sure there are enemies and hazards you have to deal with, like these guys who just want to seem to run back and forth on the screen. I guess they are after Moses, yet most of the time they want to avoid you when you start using the words on them. Seriously, they must be scared of the letter W. I mean, come on, the W's represent the plague. Which I honestly feel like there is a plague coming on to me as I play this game. So it's a good metaphor! After you complete each level, you will be given Bible questions, because that's exactly what I want in a video game, is to be treated like I'm in fucking Sunday school. Yeah, yeah, let's answer these stupid Bible questions so that way I can get this over with. Does that say, kill all babies? Seriously, they made an NES game where it says, kill all babies. Yeah, I'm done. I'm done. I'm fucking done. Seriously, what's the point of this? I mean, yeah, if you answer the questions right, you get Bibles and extra lives, and you get a picture of someone getting whipped to death, which I gotta say, that's some serious BDSM going on. But the Bibles don't really do anything, so again, I ask, what's the point of this? Like, I know this is Wisdom Tree we're talking about here, but they could have put a little bit more thought into this game. Instead, let's just take an already shitty game that we made in the past and just put Bible stuff in it. That's what God would have wanted! And yeah, Crystal Minds was made by Color Dreams, who would go on to become Wisdom Tree, because they wanted that sweet Christian cash. It's like you ask your parents for a copy of Doom, and instead you get one of these stupid Bible games and then feel deep regret afterwards. All in all, this isn't the worst I've ever played, but this is definitely boring and tedious, and I just can't stomach another minute of it, so... Yeah, I'm gonna end the review right here, so... Yeah! Happy Holidays, Merry Christmas, and, um... Uh, yeah, let's play some fucking better games in 2021.